right, so good evening from Tokyo, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew McLaughlin, or Mats. You can call me, it's my nickname. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Université Bordeaux Montaigne for holding this event. Uh, to all members of the organizing committee, especially big thank you to Amelie Mako for our correspondence back and forth, allowing me to present online from here in Japan. Um, yeah, it's around seven o'clock or after 7 p.m. in the evening here in Tokyo. Uh, in my presentation today, I'll be focusing on mostly the novel Ham on Rye, which uh, already came up in the first panel, as you know, including my own take on uh, what I believe are some of the key messages of this novel especially for young university readers here in Japan uh, who have recently emerged from that confusing period of life we all know of as adolescents. And I noticed that the title of this uh, conference, this panel is Lire Ailleurs. And also I'd like to add the word uh, enseigner Bukowski or discuter Bukowski en classe. If we're going to discuss Bukowski en classe in, in a classroom, what are we going to talk about? How are we going to approach him as a teacher? Uh, secondly, I'll briefly talk about some other social outcasts from uh, English literature and compare them with Chinaski. Uh, and finally, I'll introduce the Japanese concept of Murahachibu. I'll explain what that means later on uh, in order to establish a framework for the final section in which I'll, I'll discuss the possible benefits of teaching a book like Ham on Rye in Japan, where social ostracism is a serious problem. Uh, but this is not talked about openly because it's somewhat of a taboo. Uh, it goes without saying that Japanese society and its values are extremely different from uh, American values and social expectations and uh, French values and French expectations. However, my main argument here is, first of all, that a misfit is a misfit, irrespective of the culture and country. Someone who doesn't uh, feel that they belong either at home, at school or at work must adapt and learn either how to fit in or how to forge his or her own destiny and survive at the same time, which Bukowski managed to do. Uh, Ham on Rye, it was published in 1982, was Bukowski's fourth novel, and like previous books such as Post Office and Factotum, uh, the narrative flows forward from the perspective of the protagonist Henry Chinaski, whom we might call essentially Bukowski's alter ego. Uh, however, unlike Post Office and Factotum, Ham on Rye is a story about a writer reflecting upon his dark past a sort of horror story Bildungsroman in which Chinaski struggles with various uh, problems at home and at school, such as domestic violence, uh, failing to uh, fit in among his classmates, etc. So he's, he's a social misfit, a tough outcast who learned early on the need to fend for himself, but also uh, someone determined to blaze his own path forward. And uh, ultimately, that's what makes the novel, I think, so powerful. It's a story of an army of one against society. Uh, as Bukowski critic Gay Brewer puts it, and first of all, that name Brewer, it doesn't get better than that for a Bukowski critic. It's just fantastic. Uh, he rejects the uh, traditional family structure uh, and its attendant labor values, embracing instead a radical politics of individual achievement. So I, I like that quote. Um, and uh, typical Bukowskian themes emerge in this novel one by one, drinking, sex, classical music, which, uh, you know, I, I loved that presentation earlier on today about classical music and Bukowski, uh, writing, violence, and others. Uh, another Bukowski critic that you all know, Russell Harrison, points out that there are a number of issues that remained unexamined in the earlier novels that appear in Ham on Rye, his relationship with his family, school, etc. And it's also a very political novel, but I won't talk about the political aspects of it today. Uh, specifically, what makes Ham on Rye stand out from his other novels, I think, is its focus on his troubled life at home and at school. The closest equivalent novel to my mind is John Fante's angsty early novel, The Road to Los Angeles, in which a young Arturo Bandini is betrayed. However, unlike Fante, who, who wrote The Road to Los Angeles when he was very young, uh, in uh, Ham on Rye, here we have Bukowski bravely going back in time to confront the ghosts of his childhood, uh, in his early 60s, uh, which included the horrors of a violent father, as you know. And in an interview, Bukowski recalled his childhood as a horror story with a capital H and a capital S. Uh, as Brewer says, um, yeah, back to that wonderful name, uh, Chinaski Sr. is a powerless monster at the end of a failed American dream of avarice. And psychologically speaking, young Chinaski or Bukowski uh, from a young age is disillusioned, we could say, by the conventional chase after the American capitalist dream. Uh, he sets out to become the antithesis of his father, 
late to bed, embracing the bottle, resorting to violence only out of self-defense, never being the bully but standing up to them. Uh, I'd like to focus on another comment by Russell Harrison from that same collection called Against the American Dream. He writes, uh, Bukowski's rendering of his father is an extremely effective rendering of an individual shaped or warped, really, by social class. Um, however, uh, Brewer adds an important point to this. Uh, it is this false class alignment, peasant blood confused with a rich man's delusions that Chinesky Jr. recognizes and refuses. Now, in the context of Japanese society, I'd like to say uh, I've personally encountered many individuals who were who were shaped or warped really by social class in Brewer's terms, or to rephrase something uh, Bob Dylan once put perfectly in his song, It's All Right, Mara Money Bleeding, there are some people who are bent out of shape from society's pliers. Uh, we sense that uh, Chinaski is left uh, scarred by his childhood memories, but there's a stubborn resilience, a defiance of the fighter to get back up again and again, even after 10 or 12 rounds. Uh, in our post-capitalist, uh, industrialized, digitalized world, especially in a country like Japan, where the majority of people are already middle class, we often encounter a disparity in values, or to use Brewer's term once again, a false class alignment from one generation to the next. It's not so much that they don't belong to that class, but they don't associate with that class and its values. Uh, more specifically, I'm referring to one generation that worked really hard to rebuild the nation in the ashes of World War II and following generations who grew up in what is already more or less an affluent society. I've encountered, for example, people in the countryside whom one might identify as or classify as lower middle class, but they consider themselves to be bourgeois. And as a result, they spend money beyond their means. And then you get sons and daughters born into well-off families who shun the Japanese expectation I don't think anyone would call it a Japanese dream uh, of working for a good company and a stable uh, salary. And these are the people who do not fit in. Oops, wrong slide. Uh, they are the, uh, the nails that stick out to borrow a famous Japanese proverb, which is uh, uh, the nail that sticks out gets hammered in. Uh, and society wants to hammer them back into place, so to speak. Although recently, Japanese society is changing and the misfit is becoming more the norm out of sheer number. And here is where a novel like Ham on Rye, I think, can be very powerful in its message to such people confused about their place in society because being true to their identity appeals to them far more than any objective expectation of the pursuit of high social status. Some of them suffer from domestic violence, come from broken homes. I could give testimony to such sad stories of people born to parents, unable to love, in some cases, wielding a grudge against their children for the extra burden of being forced to raise them, feed them, and clothe them. In some sense, some of these shadowy Japanese parents, including those of a close friend of mine, remind me of Henry Chinaski Sr. Now, with the advent of the information revolution and high-tech objects such as smartphones now a part of every home, Individuals do have alternatives. Some people have successfully blazed their own path forward, becoming YouTubers or frita. Frita is a Japanese word, which means uh, someone who makes a, a living through their own freelance work. Uh, but my impression is that these people are still looked down upon by society to some degrees because they're not part of the so-called system. And there are two things that terrify Japanese people more than death. One is the R word. R stands for responsibility, and the other one is what others think of them, think of how other people perceive you. You might be thinking, okay, who cares what others think of us? But through malicious neighborhood or workplace gossip, people in Japan are easily avoided or ostracized in society. Sometimes even malicious online slandering has driven people to suicide, as seen in several tragic stories in the press over the past few years. Uh, Brewer also writes that uh, Hamon Rye exposes the fraudulent myth of social advancement through merit or hard work. And I think a lot of uh, uh, people uh, could relate to this. In the case of Chinaski, his parents' failures to find and embody any clear form of happiness with which they could fill their household uh, directly drove the young man from following in their footsteps. In fact, it drove him away onto the exact opposite path. Uh, as Harrison says, Bukowski is questioning the whole concept of the American dream because for many it was and is a freestanding house that symbolizes the promise of the United States. I mean, uh, house ownership is one of the, the main points of chapter six of his book. In other words, he shows us how superficial the vision of the American dream is. A house is not enough. 
it has to be filled with something meaningful. And to echo Tom Waits, a fan of Bukowski's here, if there is love in a house, it's a palace for sure. Otherwise, it's just a house where nobody happy lives. It's a place where they survive and eke out some kind of existence. Uh, this may surprise some not living in this country here in Japan, but this also does apply to some degree here. Uh, Japan's a country where you can make something of yourself through hard work by establishing your own business. But as a regular nine to nine, not nine to five, nine to nine company employee, and I've lived it, the days are long. It's more about patience and endurance, both physical and mental, rather than hard work in the proper sense. This entails having the mental and physical stamina to endure long hours at the office, sit through often meaningless meetings and meetings about meetings. Don't get me started on those, okay? And slowly work one's way up through the hierarchy, the company's pecking order, so to speak, in an endless game of snakes and ladders. On a short personal note here, a brief aside, I first discovered Bukowski while working at a Japanese corporation, wondering what was the meaning of my job, thus what was the meaning of my existence. It was at that moment, at the height of my confusion about where I was going in my life, that I discovered Bukowski and Factotum really spoke to me. If Chinaski were a Japanese citizen working one of these companies, he, he would have detected this fairly on, that there's something wrong, he would have bailed ship. Uh, a slight diversion, I want to consider this question, what is wealth? What is the meaning of wealth? How do we define it, since mo so many people seem to be in pursuit of it? Wealth is often thought of in financial or commercial terms, where a character like Chinaski is poor in terms of pennies in his pocket, uh, though he is rich in the currency of time and how he chooses to spend it. Becoming a full-time company employee in Japan means devoting your whole life to the job until retirement. And the longer you stay at a job, the more money in your bank account. But as the years go by, one begins to notice that one is extremely poor, a peasant, a beggar in terms of free time. And if you don't enjoy your job, then every day is living hell. Weekends are sometimes spent just catching up on sleep. And in some, in some cases, you may not receive a full pension due to endemic corruption and bureaucratic ineptitude in the system. So how does, the no how does a novel like Ham on Rye speak to someone in this situation, you might ask? Well, it has the potential to tell such people that there is hope, that sometimes it's okay if you don't try, Bukowski's slogan and gravestone epitaph, uh, which I believe has something in common with Bartleby's I would prefer not to. I'm referring to Melville's short prose work, Bartleby the Scrivener here. A f fantastic writer too, Melville. And when the odds of you being truly happy are weighed against you, perhaps bailing ship is an attractive option. Uh, Chinaski responds by fighting back, literally. As Bre Brewer says, uh, physical punishment, often recreational and undertaken with indif indifference, is linked to an endurance necessary for survival. The fight represents a test and a purgation. In the case of Japanese society, violence is a less desirable or viable option, Withdrawal from the toxic work environment and from the corporate rat race constitutes the simplest way of fighting back, resisting or escaping from the dystopic status quo. And Chinaski, the alter ego of Bukowski himself, is in a sense a hero for the downtrodden, the dispossessed, the outcast, someone who needs to be protected from the vicious sadism of society, parents, co-workers or classmates. As Brewer says, the crucial difference between father and son lies in the son's hatred of the manipulation of the weak and outcast. Uh, the title of uh, Russell Harrison's renowned collection, I think, speaks to one of the key anti-messages in Bukowski's work, that he is against the American dream because, as Brewer says, uh, the country's promise of success is a sham based on unbreachable class distinctions, and the boys recognize this. In Japan, uh, it's a different situation. I'd now like to focus on two issues to, to close my talk, uh, social indifference and social ostracism. Anyone who's experienced either of these two in Japan, I feel, could relate to the theme of sympathy for the underdog in Bukowski's work. First, let us take a look at social indifference. Uh, with the majority of people already middle class, um, there's less of an invisible but tangible class war going on. Uh, instead, it's a silent mental war in which patience and endurance are tested, and individual dreams have to be put aside and socially frowned upon to vent or voice one's individual frustrations openly. It's possible for people to not choose an illustrious and expected uh, career path in order to pursue something different, such as becoming an artist, uh, but there'll be little outside help or support outside of a few close friends. Social ostracism is a much tougher beast to come up against. And here I wish to focus on one type of social ostracism, which I've recently been reading about. It's called murahachibun. 
Unlike Hester Prynne in Hawthorne's classic novel, The Scarlet Letter, who is openly vilified and castigated for the charges of adultery, symbolized through the Scarlet A she is forced to wear upon her breast, Japanese ostracism is conventionally inflicted through silence and ignoring the alienated person's existence entirely. If someone does something that the community, i.e. your neighborhood, deems extremely unacceptable, and unacceptable means unforgivable, one is completely cut off and excluded from that community in terms of assistance and even day-to-day -day communication. One will find oneself completely shunned, alienated, and ostracized. And someone who suffers from murahachibu, which actually means, mura means village and hachibu means the eight directions. You're cut off from the village from all eight directions. This is the ultimate outcast. But I believe Bukowski's poetry and novels have the potential to resonate with such people. Japanese writer Zenji Koishikawa is author of the book Murahachibu. And referring to the Korjian Japanese dictionary, he defines it as a, a personal sanction dating back to the Edo period given after a whole village comes to a kind of informal consensus to sever ties and intercourse with a particular household when there was a violation of the social code among the villagers. That's my uh, very rough translation uh, from page 11 of his book. So what's the connection to Chinaski? The connection is, despite the obvious cultural differences and social class system, someone who immediately becomes a, a complete outcast and undesirable from society can relate to this. Bukowski himself feels he is an outcast, born into this, to use his words. The equivalent would be a Japanese individual pushed into this. One example Koishigawa gives is of a certain Mr. Hamada, who reported what he deemed to be a wrongful conduct by his superior, who was, who was trying to exclude a company employee from a business deal. When Hamada reported the matter to the company's uh, compliance division, the matter that it was being reported was leaked to the superior, as a result, Hamada was transferred to another section where he had no experience. He was excluded from all human contact in the company. This is my emphasis. And he was grilled in a sealed off room as a form of revenge. You might call this simply harassment, which it is, but it's the cutting off of all human contact is what defines this form of extreme social ostracism and humiliation. Koishikawa says it's an extremely deep rooted problem in society that still exists today. Therefore, I wish to consider uh, all social misfits across the globe, including those in Japan, and would like to stress Bukowski's potential appeal beyond the United States as someone who not only speaks for the underdog, but felt that he was the underdog himself, the misfit, who refused to fit into a society he saw as problematic, at best, uh, ill, at worst. I therefore think uh, Hamon Rai could have a strong appeal to underdogs and misfits, especially the young, disenfranchised people in Japan, or once again, to quote Bob Dylan, every hung up person in the whole wide universe, as well as people who are stuck, stuck in their company slave, that's an actual Japanese word, company slave, uh, cradled to grave jobs, to whom the novel Factotum could also be appealing. It has tremendous potential appeal for people who realize that they've been tricked into a dead end job or a situation in life and decide that they want to get out before it's too late. And as Bukowski himself reminds us with great emphasis, there's nothing worse than too late. Thank you very much.